My name is Joshua Burke. I'm a research fellow here at Policy Exchange. Um, got a great panel today to discuss energising the industrial strategy. I'm going to give a very brief overview of, of the, the subjects, uh, outlining a couple of key themes that I think are important, and then I'll hand over to the panel, who I'm sure will have something a lot more insightful to say than myself. Um, so, uh, yeah, without further ado, um, the three things I'd really like to, to frame initially are the, um, is it the importance of energy efficiency and the synergies between energy efficiency and the industrial strategy. So, for example, businesses spend £22 billion pounds a year on both gas and electricity. That's five, almost 5% of GDP. So if there's a, a way that businesses can improve energy efficiency, there's also a um, link to productivity there. So that presents the link between industrial strategy and energy efficiency. A shameless plug for me, we recently report, um, uh, released a report last week on business energy efficiency, which outlined the potential for businesses to save £1.3 billion pounds, um, on, uh, through energy efficiency savings. So obviously there's a, there's a very tangible link here between energy efficiency and productivity, and that makes the link there between the industrial strategy. The second thing I'd, I'd like to, uh, to tease out is um, the UK has got considerable expertise in uh, energy technologies, um, both mature and immature technologies. So um, electric vehicles, battery storage, they're the couple of key things that have been making the headlines recently. And indeed, the government have outlined £246 billion pounds of investment specifically for battery technologies. Uh, so um, investment in those kind of technologies, the second kind of key item I, I think is important in the industrial strategy. Um, and then the last one really is, is about infrastructure. Um, and the UK is, very, is generally very good with these kinds of things. Um, but if, anyone, if there's any project developers in the room here who have ever tried to develop any projects in Wales, I was sort of struck by the target. They said they wanted 70% renewables by 2030. If anyone's tried to connect any distributed generation projects in Wales recently, we realise that National Grid have said it's going to be 2027 before they can connect. So there's a kind of issue there around the underlying infrastructure and how that feeds in to, um, to, to the industrial strategy and, uh, and any kind of new projects in that space. Um, and the second one on the in infrastructure is there's been a couple of uh, headlines recently about electric vehicle charging points and the underlying infrastructure needed for that revolution to kick off. So without that infrastructure underpinning a lot of these things, it's going to be quite difficult for uh, certain technologies to take off, for example. So uh, they're the key, three key things, energy efficiency, energy infrastructure, and how do we kick off uh, technologies such as batteries um, and electric vehicles. They're the three kind of main items that I would um, suggest are worth talking about. So uh, I'm sure most of the people need no introduction, um, but I'll start to my left. We have uh, Richard Harrington, who is appointed uh, Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for the Department of Business, Energy and Infrastructure. To his left, uh, we have Lawrence Slade, who is the Chief Executive of Energy of U UK. To my right, we have uh, Nicola Shaw, who is the uh, Executive Director of National Grid. And to Nicola's right, we have Claire Habold, who is the Director of Corporate Affairs um, at Drax. So I will now hand over to my panellists. Um, I'm sure you're excited to hear what they've got to say. So I'm going to start uh, with my, to my left uh, with Richard. Thank you. I am to most people's left, Joshua. You get used to it in the Conservative <laughs> Party. Um, yeah, it's actually true for those people that know me. Um, well, <clears throat> I thought... Of um, when, you, when this was the the topic, energising the industrial strategy, which is a sort of bit of a pun. I didn't know if you wanted me to talk about energy or the industrial strategy, but I'd like to just firstly say that the way I, I'm doing this job, because well, technically the prime minister asked you, but Greg, Greg Clark and I hatched up this idea for me to be in the team because my background is in business for. Well, most of my adult life, really, and he wanted a business team in the business department. Now, I know it's business, energy, and industrial strategy, but it's made very clear to us, uh, to me, my speciality is energy, but it is all part of the industrial strategy and business. So, from a departmental point of view, it's 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 not separate at all. Uh, compared to, for example, when I was pensions minister, although I was at DWP, it, the P bit was separate from the the welfare bit, just 
not because anyone was trying to hide anything from anybody, but they were just completely separate roles. But it happened to be under, if you like, a management umbrella. But this is not like that. So energy is regarded as a key point of the industrial strategy. The industrial <coughs> strategy is the key to the whole uh, department. We are basically lobbyists for business energy and the industrial strategy. We are lobbyists within government, which means representing what our stakeholders tell us about, um, well, their particular interests. I mean, we're here today to talk about energy, but I promise you aerospace, the other things I do, it's all the same, what people want out of Brexit particularly, which is as near to business as usual as they can possibly have, you know, with free movement, with regulatory affairs, etc. Without going into that issue, it's our job to make sure that number 10 and number 11 know this. Um, the, the industrial strategy itself, actually, I think is really interesting because it seems to me that um, things have swung a lot in my lifetime as a, an adult. I mean, when I was at school studying economics for A-level, the industrial strategy was very clearly very centralised. You know, we went up to, actually I'm from Leeds, we went up to Newcastle to see the local NEDC, the regional department, it was effectively the regional department for industrial strategy, mm -hmm. but it was basically London with a regional office. Mm -hmm. So it went from that, it went through to the next phase, which was, if you like, in my 20s and 30s, which was Mrs Thatcher's view, which was there wasn't really industrial strategy because the market would look after it. And that's, I'm not commenting on that, but it was clearly a view. Now, the view that we have, which is to get relevant to the question that we're asked, is that we, it's kind of, it's a clear devolution the, st the whole idea is to devolve the strategy to the sectors and look for those sectors, not to pick winners or otherwise, but look to those sectors which are going to be part of, I know this sounds very grand, but a new industrial revolution. And we believe that energy, just as in the days of coal mines, um, you know, part of the industrial revolution was people who'd been agricultural kind of digging, well, it was simply digging for coal in different ways, and all of the industry that came from that and obviously the steel and everything that came from that, <coughs> the core being the energy, we really believe that the core of the, in our industrial strategy is our energy policy. Now, some may say that our energy strategy is all over the place. You know, it favours, it started off, um, you know, many people believe that the very kind of renewables that we are, are so important to us now, they started off as a SOC to focus groups. Many hardcore conservatives believed that, I hope fewer and fewer, in the same way that I hope that climate change denying is becoming fewer and fewer people. But, you know, it won not that long ago in the Conservative Party, actually the Labour Party as well, I, don't, I know we're at the Conservative Party conference, but I don't think this is particularly a party political point, it was a kind of SOC to a lobby. And I don't think anyone until quite recently um, viewed it as being an important part of an industrial strategy and that these would become industries in their own right rather than just buckets for government money so that it looks good. Um, and uh, the one that we are trumpeting, and I'd like to thank Scottish Power Renewables for this pair of socks, which is by far the most expensive gift I've ever been given in my um, job as minister and will have to be declared on my returns. But in all seriousness, it is, it is this 50% off. I mean, the offshore wind thing, as announced in the CFD, was actually, we think, very fundamental because we were late in getting an industry in this field. We were late in the manufacturing um, Siemens, who no doubt to hear, like, thank you very much for what you've done in Hull and elsewhere. But we, would, we do want to be the innovators as time moves on with this kind of thing. And we really believe that in some of the power areas, in nuclear, for example, in offshore wind, we want, to be, we want this to be part of our industrial revolution again. And we want people to look upon it as a way of making money, getting employment, rewarding shareholders and doing all the things that actually happen in industrial revolution. So it's not just because we believe in decarbonisation, of course we do, but because we want it, we want it to be a sort of capitalist core because it underpins everything and it could become as big as coal was in those days when coal was first explored. I'll leave it at that if I may, Joshua. Thank you. It's exactly five minutes, thank you very much. Um, next, Nicola, I'll turn to you if you don't mind. No pressure, five minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to follow from what Richard said by telling you that on Monday we had the lowest carbon intensity 
um, half an hour we've ever had on the UK network. So we'd had 29 hours of not using any coal to provide um, energy and electricity for the UK. And with a high wind day, we had about 11% was being supplied of our energy was being supplied by gas. The remainder was all renewables. I think that is a sign of the change that we've been through over the last few years, and a change that's been managed actually very effectively, much more so than we've seen in a number of other countries. And we are really at the cutting edge of this transition to um, a much greener energy network than we've had before. That's a big transformation for this industry, but it's also an industry that's powering a lot of other industries. And the thing that I think is getting exciting, for those of you who don't know me, my background has been in the transport industry, so I'm going to sort of segue us into transport um, to talk about electric vehicles, where I think there really is something new coming through the industrial strategy and through what we're all trying to do to continue um, to ensure that our industries are providing a framework for the future, for uh, future generations to have a better life. Um, electric vehicles are absolutely in that camp. In responding to the industrial strategy, National Grid was very focused on what can <coughs> we do to help? How can we bring together the different bits of these industries to find a way forward? Um, and I think there are probably a couple of ways. The first is thinking about range anxiety, which is the description that people use for those who do want to travel long distances in electric vehicles. Um, only, this is only about 1% of the trips in the UK, but a pretty important 1% of the trips if you're going to encourage people to move to the use of electric vehicles. Um, and we think there is a real case for investment in a sort of backbone, a bit like the national grid, of infrastructure to provide that support um, connected to motorway service stations and um, larger roadways um, stations. So real thought about that and a thought with the battery industry and the local authorities in towns and cities across the country about how we provide charging at the home and how we make that charging smart. You'll probably have seen that there's been a discussion um, in the energy industry about the implications of smart charging or charging of vehicles. Can we make that clever? Can we make that supply something to the grid that will continue to help us balancing the system over the long term? And I think that a lot of what we can do, industry working with government, but I think industry coming together with scientists, with um, technology providers across the globe, actually, will help us move this agenda forward. <coughs> I think we can do it pretty quickly. So I see that as a very exciting part of what you're talking about, Joshua, bringing technology together with investment in infrastructure to deliver changes in the way that we live in the UK. I think that's less than five minutes, but succinctly delivers what I wanted to say this morning. Thank you very much. Um, Lawrence, I'll, I'll turn to you for me. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> thank you, everyone. Um, I think building on some of the points we've seen, and particularly um, Richard's point around the need to work together, because I think one of the areas that uh, the current progress has illustrated is how interconnected every aspect of this industry is with the broader industrial base of the UK. And I think the only way to approach this um, <coughs> to create a st true strategy is to look at how you can pull the different segments together. So everything is interrelated from whether you're looking at the generation base through to how you're looking at customers and how they use uh, their energy. So there's a real need to actually look at the sector and its relationship with broader industry and business in a very holistic manner and to understand the different drivers that exist between each element of technology and how you can pull those together. And that goes right from looking at, as Nicola was saying, EV strategy. We've really got to get to grips with understanding how people use their cars. Actually, what is the most convenient way for them to charge it? Is it actually in the office? Is it at home, et cetera? How do we understand that? Because only once you understand that can you actually start seriously looking at how you're investing in the national infrastructure to support that. Heat. We're all very, very addicted to our gas boilers. So actually, how do we look at how we reduce our carbon from the gas networks? How do we look at green gas going forward? How do we look at a broader strategy on how we actually reduce the carbon output from our heating? How do we look at uh, those families who are off the gas grid, for example? Where's a strategy to actually bring them together? How do we look at increasing the efficiency. Uh, Joshua mentioned the efficiency of buildings. Well, really, we've barely scratched the surface in terms of making our built 
business infrastructure more efficient, but we've also got an awful long way to go in actually how we make our homes more efficient. And we need a long-term strategy that links those two together. And we would argue very strongly that actually, if you want to cure some of the problems that exist in our society, and if you want to, as Joshua said, make our businesses more uh, productive, then actually, efficiency should be a national infrastructure priority. Let's really put our shoulders behind something that we've been trying to achieve since the late 90s. But I think going back to the, the cross-sector um, element of this, we are quite obviously an industry in transition, but it's a heck of an exciting transition. You know, we are moving from an industry that's been reliant on one or two technologies for the generation and distribution of our electricity and our energy into one that suddenly has literally dozens of different en um, technologies available to it, from virtual power stations, from improved demand-side response, through to biomass, through to offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, you name it, it's there. And actually, the critical thing is how we look at bringing those strategies together and bringing those different strands. What we want is a framework from government that then allows industry to go out and deliver. To pick up your phrase on Thatcher, you know, the market will deliver. I think the point being, if you can get that framework in place, if you can give us the long-term certainty of the, the path that, you, that we're going along, industry can then actually pick up with that and will actually start developing it. We've seen <coughs> with offshore wind just what happens to an industry sector if they get that long-term certainty, if they get that vision and, and leadership from government. And a, a sort of final point, I think, and I was asked at the House of Lords about this the other day, what opportunity <coughs> is there for, for the UK and the energy sector post-Brexit? Well, actually, one of the opportunities is to say, hang on a moment, we actually are leading in some of these industries on a global basis. <coughs> Maybe an opportunity from Brexit is to actually stand four square behind a cleaner car clean carbon climate and a clean car low carbon economy and actually see how we can lead the world in this and actually put a full-blown strategy behind that thank you thank you very much uh last but not least um Claire, thank you. thanks joshua well it's great to be back in the energy sector i've only just joined drax after 10 years um working for another important infrastructure uh, project called Heathrow but it's great 10 years on wow what a difference how the industry has changed and how exciting it is so I'm really thrilled to be back in the energy sector at this incredible time the industry really is going through a revolution as Nicola said um, coal power stations st stopped generating electricity uh, this for the first time since the industrial revolution that's absolutely fantastic wind and solar power both hitting record highs on a monthly basis and the distinction between uh, generators and suppliers is becoming increasingly blurred. So the whole market is really changing, which is thanks to decentralized energy and real innovation in the retail sector as well. Mm. So as a consequence, all our business models were having to evolve and, and change. And that's exactly what we've done at Drax. We've really changed our business model. In just a few years, we've uh, come off uh, from being the largest coal-fired power station uh, in the UK to generating 16% of the country's total renewable power. And in doing that, not only have we protected the jobs uh, in, in, uh, in Yorkshire and our other employees, but also the 14,000 supply uh, jobs throughout the, the country, which I think is really important. This hasn't been easy. We've really... Uh, used our innovation, the expertise of that fantastic engineering excellence that we have in our northern powerhouse in Yorkshire. Very proud to be Yorkshire. All our Yorkshire engineers very proud uh, to, to have that, that legacy. And we've worked really closely with the northern powerhouse, the great universities of the north, really using this great innovation that we have in the north. So we're very, very proud to be, to be, to be playing our, our part in that. And you might have seen that we're actually uh, going into other areas as well. Um, we are put forward proposals to convert two of our remaining coal-fired units to gas, as well as uh, putting in planning permission for building the largest battery in the country, 200 megawatt battery storage unit. So we're really keen to be at the 
absolute cutting edge of innovation and um, energy technology. And we do that not just for the North and for Drax, but we do that for the UK. You know, the expertise and the innovation that we have led in this country is absolutely astounding. And as um, Claire Perry said yesterday, the Minister for Climate Change, she doesn't think as a country we really take the value and recognition of that. But Drax wants to be very much at the centre of that and at the centre of this great um, electric um, revolution. We are also very keen to support National Grid, really support the power system which is changing, give flexible power, but also make sure that we re respond to the needs of the grid and we deliver at scale. Uh, we want to support that stability and give you know, things like inertia, frequency response and voltage control. We want to play our part in actually delivering that and making sure that the grid gives that security supply and flexibility uh, to the country. And we're also very keen to innovate in the retail area and support businesses, small businesses, give them renewable energy at affordable prices and really help businesses make the best use both in terms of efficiency and, and also effectiveness in how they use power. We're very keen to develop in that space. So how can we play our part in delivering the company, country's uh, industrial strategy, which we are a huge uh, supporter of, and we want to play our part, particularly in the North. The North is really the powerhouse for the rest of the country in terms of power. We generate 41% of electricity, um, and it is absolutely fantastic in terms of offshore wind in the Northeast, nuclear in the Northwest. Really, the North is literally the powerhouse. Of, of, of the country. We've got the infrastructure, we've got the skills, and we've got the expertise and the knowledge base, and we want to do more of that. Um, at Drax, we see our role in developing that skills, that innovation very seriously. Uh, we have lots of partnerships with the great um, universities of Leeds, Sheffield, York, Nottingham, and we also work with London and Wales, and we believe that there's a real opportunity to develop, develop that skills and opportunity to, to support the government in their skills strategy. We're supporting a number of PhDs at the moment, actually, on all sorts of um, new technologies, whether it's battery technology, distribution energy storage, um, looking at uh, customer interaction with vehicles to the grid system using smart technology. We're looking at all these areas and working with, um, with, the, the, with the great talent that we've got in our, in our universities. We're also very keen to support colleges and schools we want to get people into engineering, the technical skills. We work very closely with our schools and colleges. Um, so we really want to play our part in, in literally powering the North. So basically, we have set out our stall. And what we have done in Drax, I think, is, is a great tribute to the Yorkshire engineering and excellence. And we want to build that. We want to make sure that the UK uh, can um, benefit from that. And we want to make sure that we and the UK are at the forefront of this fantastic energy revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to pick up on one thing before I turn to the audience, which, which you mentioned. I think the Drax example is, is, is a very good one in, in looking at the ways in which the, what I outlined earlier in terms of um, using existing infrastructure and the, and the battery storage Drax is a good example of where existing infrastructure is being utilised in a new way, whether that's the grid connections uh, for the old coal-fired coal power station to be used for gas, um, and then also uh, with the development of the biggest battery in the UK, that's kind of the two, two of the three um, strands I outlined earlier, and I think that's it's quite nice that Drax uh, helped me out there and picked out two of the three that I uh, outlined earlier. So. Uh, I'm going to turn to the floor now for some questions. Um, if I could just ask you to state your name and organisation, and also please make sure it's a question, not a statement. If it is the latter, uh, I will, uh, you know, maybe pick someone else. Um, uh, so the lady in the front here with the uh, orange pen or pencil. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, Lawrence mentioned the need for a long-term energy strategy with energy efficiency at its core, which is really good news. Um, but my question is, how do we bring that about? Um, I guess it would have to be cross-departmental. It would have to transcend governments. Wasn't that the sort of thing the National Infrastructure Commission was supposed to be involved with or advising on? And if not, who and how can we do it? Do I have a statement? Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I agree. I mean, Andrew Adonis is uh, in and out of the department all the time. He's chairman of the National Infrastructure Commission, and they are a part of it. 
and I personally would like to see them doing more and more. I think they're an excellent resource. And I think in governmental terms, it's quite new for the government um, since it was set up. And I think that they've not quite got used to it from a cross-governmental point of view. That's just my observation based on a few months. But um, I've certainly got a close, well, personal relationship with Andrew going back many years. But with, the, uh, you know, he's introduced me to the institution. Greg Clark's always been a fan of, of what they and he do, and I, I think it's very important. But your cross-governmental point, whilst very valid, is true of almost anything in government. Um, and it's the frustrating part of being in government. The fact is there are, you know, a lot of departments. I think if you were, if you were designing government from new you probably wouldn't have so many departments, and you, you, you just wouldn't. I mean, a company wouldn't. They'd merge, and they, et cetera. But we've got Bayes. It's a new entity, and it's a serious long-term entity. Um, I would like to see it taking over quite large sections of what government does. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's our job in practical terms, and officials are far better at this than people... Than, well, certainly before I was a minister than I ever thought. They are far better at working together sometimes because they really have to, the Treasury being a classic example, everyone has to work with the Treasury in any department, by definition they involve spending government money, but I've found with the other departments as well, and sometimes it is a pain, but in big businesses as well, you know, you have the different divisions and finance get involved in nearly everything in the same way, so I don't think it's that dissimilar or that unusual, but it, yes, it is, it's frustrating, but we're aware of that. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the panel to add? I think I'd, uh, just to add to that, um, you won't be surprised to know that we have a discourse ongoing with Lord Dennis on this exact point. Um, and I pick up on the point of the cross-government working. I think there's, there's another issue here which we didn't really touch on. So there's one about what we do with our existing uh, built environment. There's another issue about what we do about the mm. buildings yet to be built. And I think there's a, there's a huge planning issue uh, and maybe colleagues at DCLG uh, would have something to say on this, on actually how we ensure that we are building buildings that are fit for purpose for the next 50, 100 years, etc., regardless of whether they're domestic or business or industrial. So we've got to, as I say again, look at everything to make sure we're not missing opportunities. Thank you. Next lady. So uh, on energy efficiency, I think I'd just make two points. The first is um, the success, really, of demand-side flexibility which has been um, a way for businesses to make money out of managing their electricity use more effectively. So um, we provide a mechanism whereby we can give people information about their um, ability to turn down their use of electricity at times when there is a lot of demand. And it's, you don't have to move it very much to make quite a big difference to your bills. That's made a difference for businesses, and it does exactly what it says. It makes us more efficient and think about our energy use. I think I'm seeing the same with households, and certainly smart metering technology being rolled out is intended to do that um, and to help households think about how they can find ways of using their energy more efficiently. Clearly, with higher energy bills likely to come from electric vehicles, if you're charging your vehicle at home, that's going to change the way that you spend your money. It's not going to be at the petrol pump. It's going to be in electricity for your vehicle. That will increase that incentive because you're going to be putting more money through your energy bill. So I think there is a real link here. If you give people the technology to be able to make the decisions for themselves, they do. We've seen that with businesses and we're seeing it with individuals. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take another question. Um, gentleman there with, with the glasses on. Gregson Clove from Telford. Why isn't it compulsory to build houses and roads that produce their own energy? Thank you. Um, I'll turn to you first, if, if I may. Well, I think that's a that's a government policy um, issue, really, for more for the for the government. But I think the um, I think helping and incentivising people, um, educating them, and giving them the opportunity and not understanding the benefits, I think is I think is only a positive thing. Um, we're really keen at Drax to help our customers understand the benefits. Um, but I think there's a communications issue here as well. I think we need to really, as an industry, sell, sell the benefits and really tangible benefits of why, or why you know, houses like this are, are such a good idea. But I think, we could, I think we could do a lot together in the industry, but I think we could also do it in partnership with government as well. Thank you. Richard? Well, I think, uh, I think it's an admirable um, 
policy for the future, but and we are moving towards it. But you know, in um, in my constituency, there's BRE in Garston. I don't know if any of you have been there, but they had when Greg Clark was shadow housing spokesman in 2008, he gave me a call and said you should see this, and they'd invited different developers, Barrett's and the others, to build this street of houses in different ways, which was the first time I've seen anything like that. It's probably only about nine years ago, which was precisely what you were saying. I mean, they were expensive because they had to bring special triple glazing glass from Scandinavia and here and everywhere else. But I remember chatting to the guy from Barrett's and he said, well, if we can produce them in volume, we'll probably be at a 30% premium to regular bills. But of course, even forgetting the um, environmental side of it, which obviously is very important, but even commercially, um, he reckoned if that was added on to a mortgage, there'd be a payback in 10 or 15 years. And I think we've moved on exponentially since then. And I saw in California, um, last when I went to see Tesla, you know, this idea, basically grid-free world, you know, isn't it, what they think, that all this grid stuff's extremely old-fashioned, that we'll all have our cars, which will be, apart from taking us to places, will be a storage of energy for our houses. And, of course, it will come from solar and other places. You plug it in, your battery in your car holds it overnight and uses it as it needs it, and then off you'll go in the morning. Well, we're a long way from that, and we're a long way from being able to make it as compulsory as some people would like. But I do see, just forgetting the grid or not grid issue, because I think there's big differences in the climate and everything in California, not even talking about that, but I see things moving towards that. And I certainly believe that building of the future will certainly involve a lot of the things that are experimental now that will just become as normal as insulation and things that we just now take for, for granted, which weren't that long ago. Thank you. I'd just like to add, um, at the same time as well, a greater move to distributed generation, particularly at the, at the home level, whilst it's a, an admirable and uh, is definitely the way to, to go, there's a bigger question or the, around the implications of that, particularly around the transmission network. So if everything does move to a more distributed mm. network, there are larger questions that will loom about who pays for the transmission network and the main, maintenance of that. So uh, yes, distributed energy is a, is a an or if you know all our houses did move off grid, that's great. But then there is a, a separate issue around the maintenance of, of uh, the transmission network as well. <coughs> Lawrence, do you know anything to add? Um, I think, yeah, yes, it is a policy issue, but I, I, the only comeback I'd say is that a lot of these technologies, I would say, are getting to the point where they are now established. And so I think some of the older arguments are disappearing, and actually we need to see people stepping up to the mark or to actually start getting some of these things more as business as usual as opposed to, oh, it's something special. You know, if you think that uh, over the summer, and Nicola can correct me if I get the figure wrong here, something like 52.4% of our electricity was from renewable sources, that's an integral part of what we're doing as a country now. And more and more of these areas are becoming that. So let's start dealing with it on that basis. And actually, let's start putting real innovation money behind it. So the 240 million for batteries, great. What else can we do to actually start accelerating some of these things? Uh, I, look, I think we, we are accelerated. I think that this <coughs> country has moved enormously quickly by comparison with most other nations into a renewable world. We're basically there. As I said, I think we have a very high proportion of our energy comes from renewables. And what we've done is managed through a period of uncertainty. I think that will continue, by the way, until we get out to the middle of the 2020s, that there's going to be a lot more variability in the system that we are managing. I think also the notion of transmission going away, I'm sorry, guys, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I, given that I run the transmission networks, but I actually think there's a need for stability in the whole. And what the transmission businesses do is provide access for some of the things that are offshore or at the margins of the system to provide the balancing across all that allows these extra creative flexibility around the edges. And we need that to happen. We need that balance between all. So I, I think transmission will continue. I agree with you. We will have to enter into a discussion about how that works and how we all enjoy the benefits of it. But I think that it is here to stay. Thank you. Um, the lady in the glasses, uh, second row there. My name's Nina Scrubs, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Renewable Energy Association. And um, representing members who've been part of this energy revolution over the last years, 
and it is really heartening and exciting. And the question I have for the panel is, how do we ensure that we enable this revolution to continue and at the same time protect the interests mm. of the consumers? We've worked very hard as a trade association to introduce codes, standards, because we're still talking about power mm. and gas, <coughs> uh, transitions to new systems. We need to keep people safe because the one thing that could stop this is if we don't do it well. So how do we, on one hand, put the right framework in place that enables this revolution to happen for us to make some mistakes, but on the second hand, we, with the government support and the regulator support, enable consumers to have a positive experience and understand how this will dramatically improve their energy bills in the future as they become more like prosumers. Thank you. Does anyone have a burning desire to take it? Yes. Um, I'd say there, there are perhaps four steps uh, that we need to do on this. Um, and I agree entirely, by the way. I think the, the first point is we need an engaged customer. If you haven't engaged your customers, then you're not going to be able to sell them the benefits of actually what you're doing. The second point is you need to make it accessible. Um, so you need to actually help people understand what you're talking about at every level. There are always going to be early adopters who already have solar panels on their roof. Maybe they're getting a battery. We're not worried about those people. How do you get other people involved? How do you get social housing associations involved in the massive um, amount of houses that are in that sector? How do you bring the benefits to those people who really need them in those environments who perhaps really don't understand this technology? Um, I think myths are a, are a big, big issue, whether it was the recent debate we had around um, some of the network issues around car charging, etc. We've got to jump on these myths, and we've actually got to make sure that there's a cohesive approach or coordinated approach to actually delivering against those, no matter which part of the industry you're from. And I think also it's, it's all around working together. Um, I, it's a theme of mine, but it's, it's an important factor in this sector at the moment, is that we've all got to pull together and actually look at our, each of our roles in delivering this new, very, very exciting economy. Because it will happen, it is happening, but it will happen much <coughs> faster if we've got engaged customers, if we're making the technology really accessible, and if we're all pulling together. Thank you. Richard? Well, yeah. Yeah. Before I say the answer to this question, I, I hope Nicola doesn't think that I was sort of calling for the abolition of the national grid or anything <laughs> in the last thing. But evolution-wise, I think there will be bits and that people do do quite legitimately. But on to the, on to the, on to the main question. My concern is with renewables is that it just becomes another... I know the price has come down, I'm very grateful for it, and really very pleased. That's not just a platitude or being condescending. But there is no gov government will always have a limited amount of money to subsidise energy, and all this stuff about oh it's CFDs, it's a financial instrument, all this stuff it's it's very misleading. It's just how much government subsidy are we giving for very legitimate reasons? That's the choices government have to make, like for education and stuff like that. I'm not belittling it, but the difference is for energy. It is something that we do for a purpose for a time, and it's. It's not a long-term part of anybody's strategy because we'll have to move it to other up-and-coming sectors, etc. Mm -hmm. And my concern is when there's a, an attempted change of policy and you know, everyone comes from all over the place. I mean, because we're doing this tiny con consultation on biomass, Nigel Adams, who's the MP for Drax, I'm pleased to say because it's enough... It's well done to Nigel. He's calling me out every 10 minutes. I'm on holiday for four days. I mean, the world is not ending. He is an MP. You are employed in his constituency. It's only a bloody, excuse me, consultation, you're going to say. But this is what the energy industry is like. Actually, to be fair, when I was doing pensions, it was much the same with any change of regulation. Shall I say this is what democracy is like? Yeah. Which is all well and good. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's good. Yorkshire, so but it's very good, isn't it? That, that this does this sort of thing. Actually, re the reality happens. But my concern is that sections of industry, energy being a good example, kind of think that, yeah, you know, prices are coming down, et cetera, but there's this long-term entitlement to subsidy. And it isn't. Not because government's saying well, there's no money at all for energy, but there'll be new things coming along with new objectives that need a limited amount of money used, like, for example, Greg's 
um, the Faraday Challenge, which he's very, very, con very committed to. I mean, the, on the first minute of my job, he said, well, this is what we're doing, we've got to do it. You know, basically, you must be on board with it. Well, of course, I was. But this is an another use for government money. The whole industrial strategy is. So um, I'd only caveat um, what you've said with that one point, just to, to bear in mind, which is not a change of policy or U-turn or anything else. It should be obvious, but sometimes industries become dependent on government money, and this can't be one of them. And the, the legitimate use of government is to kickstart it. Exactly. For, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and if I could just build on that for, for, for industry, I think, you know, as I said earlier, you know, the skills, the expertise, the innovation that industry uh, can have, and we can do this together as well, is, is that that is where industry can really um, support the government agenda. And, it, and it's, that is not subsidised. That's industry really developing and, and exceeding expectations about how we can really keep that incredible um, revolution going and really power through, literally. Thank you. Nicola, do you have anything to add? <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious I've taken questions only from the first half of the room, so uh, there is no bias. I will look uh, to the gentleman uh, at the very back, uh, right-hand corner. Thanks very much. It's uh, Doug Parr from Greenpeace. Um, so I, I just want to build a bit on the last question because um, we were... Uh, we were um, Involved in making those socks that uh, the minister was just showed up earlier, the wind socks as we call them. And uh, one of the things we know from engaging with the developers like Scottish Power is that they are, <laughs> thank you, uh, they are they are they are anxious to find a way to getting subsidy free. Yeah. Uh, and you know, frankly, so they should. Uh, the solar industry is on its way. Uh, let's hope the car manufacturers do the same with EVs. I just put that on one side for a moment. Um, but. Um, I think, so my question would be, um, it's very important that um, having seen the price drop that they can deliver and they want to go further, they will go further, that there's a clear pipeline as to what the future policy looks like and, and what they can expect to have to deliver. Uh, last night, one of the representatives from the um, uh, offshore wind industry was saying, you know, we are a little bit worried about the pipeline now for the mid-2020s. Uh, just because we haven't had that certainty uh, about what's going to happen going forward. So I'm wondering if the minister could uh, could reassure us that the uh, in the next few weeks or month or c before the end of the year, anyway, we will see some clarity about what the replacement for the levy control framework is going to be. That there will be a timetable for new auctions, and then that industry that has delivered such great price drops will be able to take it further. Thank you. Well, it's a simple answer. If your question was in the next few weeks or months, with an S, then yes, I can say that. But I can't be more specific than that, simply because you know what it, government is like. It, it takes time, but there's no intention not to do any of that at all. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, uh, at the very back. Uh, Simon Pickett, Optimus Investments. Um, I tend to agree that it's something to celebrate that um, subsidy support is being withdrawn for mature technologies. We see size of problem, electricity, transport, heat. What's really exciting is transport. We've got 70 um, fully electric buses whizzing around London. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, regulatory barriers, but actually there's capital there to finance a clean conversion to transport in our major cities. How do we be slightly more um, like China in our ambitions to drive that faster? Thank you. Lawrence, do you have anything? I think it, it's a lot of it is how we engage people. I'll go back to that point. Um, I think the more you can engage people, the more you get people on side and defeat some of the myths that are around and get people adopting these new technologies, it becomes, it will just regenerate all the time and a self yeah, from, from, it will just happen. So get people engaged, get them on board, defeat the myths, and actually really start getting people understanding just what the benefits are that this can bring. Thank you. Anyone else? Nicola? Um, 
So maybe I'll talk a little bit about gas. We haven't really talked about gas, and you you mentioned um, decarbonisation of heat as the uh, next big issue. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the industry over the last year about what is the future of gas and how that might change. Um, we already see a lot of different technologies being used to think about um, heavy goods vehicles, typically not electric, although there are some buses in London. Um, those tend to be powered by different forms of gas, um, biogas, biodiesel, but also um, other things. So I think that, that is a big area. Um, in the de decarbonisation of heat, 90% of the homes in the UK are powered by gas at the moment. It seems that that's a big challenge to change that and very costly potentially. So more likely to, as a way of decarbonising that is finding a way of taking the carbon out of the gas. Um, and there are a number of activities underway, trialling different systems, either at local level um, it, with some towns and cities or with universities, um, and there are also some things trialling different ways of taking of changing the gas mix and changing the um, mm. carbon element of gas. Those all seem like really useful and promising ways of thinking about the future of um, heat. And I think that that uh, there is a somewhat of a myth. I've, the one I've heard is worry about electric vehicles in the 2020s, worry about decarbonisation of heat in the 2030s. I just don't see that as a being a, a such a linear progression. Actually, I think. We need to engage now in some of these technologies. And the questions out there are really interesting. And the things that I'm seeing as solutions are interesting and coming very much from the industry. Um, I don't see these ones as being subsidy driven and kind of government related. There's a lot coming out of industry that's making mm -hmm. those changes, which I think is exciting. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we're very much getting into this whole thing about storage. And, and, and uh, so I think it's a really exciting technology. And we'll just have to keep looking at all these different te technologies. Mm. And, but I do agree with Lawrence that the consumer needs to be educated on the benefits. Yeah, thank you. Richard, anything to add? No, I think okay. I've been up <laughs> yeah. uh, I agree with what people thank say. You. The, the lady in the blue jacket, uh, Ralph. Thank you. Helen McDade, John Muir Trust. Uh, I just wonder what happened to carbon capture and storage? Does it exist? Uh, you know, as someone who watches the industry but isn't in it, I'm a bit confused. Richard, perhaps you can give the insight there. It's not forgotten about, but progress has been slower than I would have hoped. <laughs> Is that the time? Sorry. I, <laughs> I believe Claire Perry was indicating yeah. that there might be something in the Clean Growth Plan yes. when that's published in a couple of weeks' no, time. That's the, reason, that's the reason for my reticence, <laughs> because it's Claire's thing, but uh, it's not honestly not forgotten about. But some, it is, some of these things are frustratingly slow. Thank you. The, 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 I, so the thing I'm hearing about is instead of having very, very big projects, much more localised projects with, and particularly in relation to that um, decarbonisation of heat agenda, thinking about localised projects. There's one in Leeds, I think, to um, do something to create hydrogen very close to the homes um, with carbon and capture and storage involved. So again, funded differently, different scale, but still progress. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I'd add is, um, someone mentioned the point about business certainty earlier. Uh, if, if carbon capture storage does make a comeback, it'd be quite interesting to see how many businesses are willing to engage with that, given what, what happened last time. But um, yeah. Um, um, the gentleman on the left, uh, Richard. Hello there. Um, my name is Peter Smith from National Energy Action, a fuel poverty charity. I was very interested in the Minister's remarks uh, regarding uh, the need for uh, government to uh, push away the calls for more money, essentially. Um, given that the, the Treasury receives about £17 billion uh, over this Parliament uh, from domestic energy consumers, is there any scope, potentially in the upcoming budget, to liberate some of that for uh, keeping ho homes warmer and making them more energy efficient uh, and therefore increasing productivity? Well, I've got the ultimate cop-out by saying you'll have to wait for the budget because that is the budget process, as many people know. But I wouldn't hold your breath. Now, that doesn't mean it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the lady on the, in the end on, with the glasses there, please. Hello. Um, in order to provide a stable platform of low carbon generation, nuclear has a crucial role to play mm. to underpin the renewable forms of generation. 
Um, my question is, to what expen extent does the panel agree with that statement, and is the government doing enough to kick-start new nuclear? Thank you. Well, uh, I didn't catch your name or organisation. Sorry, it's Lindsay Roach, Westinghouse. Thank you very much. Uh, Claire, I'll start with you, if I may. Well, it, energy is not our, our, our bag. It's not a, not a technology that we're exploring, so I think I'll leave okay. it to you. Um, is nuclear going to be part of the mix was the question really wasn't yeah. it yes <laughs> and do you think it's a, a no, good I wasn't being facetious about it I mean, it is yeah. Yeah. and do you think it's a good cost effective means of decarbonisation I think we need an energy mix like we have now um, anyone visiting because uh, operations at Wokingham sees how important nuclear is to it, which is now, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what you told me, but I think it's in the 20s of the cent most days, yes. um, that kind of thing. Um, and with Drax, uh, with, um, sorry, I've got Drax on the brain, haven't oh, I? No. With, that's because I started Hinkley. Draxing too early this morning. <laughs> um, but with um, Hinkley, um, that will be, I think, 5 or 6%, and it's significantly, um, that's a significant drop in the percentage of our requirements, um, and I see nuclear as part of, um, of more than that. Now, the financing question, of course, is the critical question with nuclear. Um, we've got criticised a lot for Hinkley, the system of financing, which we obviously think is very good for the taxpayer because of involving no government money up front. The general consensus would appear to be that you can't have a nuclear power station without the government holding the big chunk of the original equity. Um, and I'm, I have no reason to believe that there's a third model between what we had at Hinkley, which is in Cruda's business sense, somebody else paying for it and everyone else paying for it out of production, out of the supply, or government being um, the main the, the main finances of it, so that down the line the actual energy cost is, is lower. But actually it amounts to the same. If you just add everything together, it's, just, it's a question of financing. Um, and I can't say more than that because there isn't more than that to say other than the fact that for um, I don't accept this fact that just because wind has come down so well, for which I think is fantastic, that that suddenly rules out nuclear. I don't think it would be right to say or fair to say, um, and I think it does not reflect the fact that our policy is to have a mix of different sources of energy, and I'm sure National Grid are very pleased of that and support it fully. Thank you. Um, Lawrence or Nicola, do you have anything to add? Happy with that answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll move on. Um, next question, uh, the gentleman here, please. Thank you. Ray Bailey from Horsham in Sussex. I'm incredibly excited about the electric vehicles and the contribution they're obviously going to make. Um, but the larger uh, versions, the longer range with the bigger batteries, they're necessarily more expensive. And perhaps it was an unintended consequence. But um, I'm finding that a lot of those evangelists are being stopped in car parks, being asked by admirers, what's this electric car? So they are actually the salespeople that can help to engage. My question is... Was it an unintended consequence of including those cars in the uh, luxury car tax bracket? Um, because it seems that those early adopters are being penalised by having to pay a tax. And, and obviously government funds are limited, but this is not so much an incentive by giving money away, but rather it's taking money from those evangelists that are trying to act as the sales force. Thank you. Does anyone have any immediate response? I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer to the un unintended consequence bit. I suggest it was financially driven rather than any great policy driven at all. Um, and I do see, well, I think we've all, we can see that the world ahead of us, the way it's going with cars. And it's quite straight. People come up to me and say, well, you know, you haven't thought about all the extra electric power that this is going to take, as if... You know, Michael Gove, who made that announcement, which was only really saying what we all knew anyway because of Paris, that you know, no one's thought of this, that Nicola and her colleagues would just sort of wait until about three months before 2040 and then say, oh dear, we need all this extra stuff. But it's very exciting, and it will become a commodity product, not a luxury product, and so it should be. 
and I think that will come with volume. Um, remembering what a luxury product it was when the internal combustion engine started. I mean, it was, admittedly, people were a lot poorer generally, but, you know, it was an exclusive product for very rich people, but it didn't take that long. Could I have a very quick supplementary, Of course. Um, Clearly, the um, luxury car tax was to attack the, uh, the internal combustion engine and fossil fuels, um, the legacy car industry, um, and that's obviously fair. Um, because if somebody can afford a luxury premium yeah. um, engined car, then they should pay more. And perhaps the unintended consequence was that thought was not given to the fact that EVs were included in that by default. Mm. I think it's probably the case as well, though, that not all EVs are included in that, um, and there are a substantial growing number of models that very definitely do not fit that model. Uh, and I think it was Nissan who came out a couple of weeks ago with a model that has a massively enhanced range that sort of starts moving away from that area. So I think rather like Richard was saying earlier, it's one of those er areas where technology is delivering week by week, month by month, the ranges are going up, the costs are coming down. But I think, you know, as we said in a report we published on EVs a couple of weeks ago, you've got to look at the whole sector and make sure that everyone gets access to this, from people that have drives, to people that don't have drives, to people who commute to work, to people who um, their cars are at home Monday to Friday, they've got more flexibility how they can support the grid. There's an awful lot of questions, but ultimately, we know what they are, we're working together on them, and it is really exciting. And it's also started at the bottom end as well, with those Indian, the gee whizzes. And it's not always been an exclusive Lexus, you know, and this kind of thing. And I agree with you. I think it will end up, well, it will end up as a commodity product in a good way. You know, like the internal combustion engine. Be, I'm sure the luxury end of it will be the same as the luxury end of it with, um, you know, Rolls Royces and Bentleys and everything like that as a method of propulsion. But the actual different levels of, well, I suppose, like most other items in life, um, hopefully it will just develop in the normal way. But I don't think it will be fiscally driven at different ends of it. A luxury product's a luxury product, whether it's a, an EV or a or a diesel or petrol. I suppose diesels aren't really right at the top end. They never were because Not of the there. noise. But Well, I don't think they ever <laughs> were quite in the same way for the very expensive cars because people didn't care about the, um, the cost of the fuel. Thank you. Um, I'm aware Richard has to shoot off now, so I just want to say a big thank you for his contribution. Thank you very um, much, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, I've got another comment for this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Richard. much, Josh. Uh, I'll take... Uh, Three last questions, uh, if we've got time, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Uh, so the gentleman here, Ralph in the glasses. Um. Thank you. Robert Mitchell, uh, Deputy Cabinet Member for Highways in Essex County Council and Braintree District Council. Um, I dipped toe in the water as far as the local plan was concerned. Uh, uh, about 18 months ago, which was regarded by planning officers as a bit, as a bit dodgy. I think the climate has changed from government announcements on electric, etc. Uh, in all our major applications, major planning applications through the local plan, and this is certainly beneficial to anybody else who has not yet submitted it, we just have, um, we asked for 20% of all uh, calculated power use to be provided by on-site renewables for any major development. As I say, it was regarded as a dip of a toe in the water, but it helps to make the uh, national grid more uh, sustainable because obviously we now need to, as well to add in uh, EV, EV charging uh, potential in homes as they're built. And much cheaper Sorry to, to build. Interject. Do you have, we're very the question time. is, can we uh, add a supplementary effectively is what needs to be done to the MPPF to make sure that these sort of uh, on-site renewables are put in place at build rather than a little add-on at the end. Thank you. Uh, I'll take one more because we're that short on time. A gentleman there, Ralph, uh, with the glasses on. Forward. Thank you. Okay, right, thank you very much. Uh, yesterday, uh, Rolls-Royce did a presentation on small modular reactors, and I noticed there was a question from Westinghouse over there that were intent on developing small modular reactors. It's a pity the government minister's actually gone because it could be a way forward that we get small modular reactors that are reasonably cheap and almost, almost in the market. I just wonder if there would be any 
chance of getting government funding to develop small modular reactors from either Rolls-Royce or Westinghouse. Thank you. Okay, so just to summarise, is, uh, is there anything additional to MF, uh, MM, MPPF finance for on-site renewables? Um, and second question is, what was the likelihood of government support for SMRs? It was a national planning policy framework question. Yeah. Uh, that, which, that which I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the challenge at the moment seems to me, and we sort of touched on it before, was on housing and the, dr the drivers to build houses, regardless of what's in them um, at the moment, because we haven't got enough as a nation. So I think the government is going to be reluctant for some time, I'm guessing, to put extra burden on development costs. So uh, it's an interesting challenge you've put in for businesses, and it sounds like something that's innovative in Essex. Um, and the uh, the smaller um, nuclear plants, I think there's a lot of conversation in the industry about those at the moment. How they'll come forward and how the government will want to take them forward, I think, is probably um, certain, something that will be an ongoing discussion. I haven't heard from them. I don't know if you have, Lawrence, what the next steps are. I mean, just on that point, uh, I mean, as far as nuclear is concerned, we're... we're of the view that nuclear should be in the mix along with everything else. We are technology agnostic in that respect. Um, and there are ongoing conversations with government and those syndicates that are looking at small modular reactors. Uh, Rolls-Royce being one, I think Westinghouse are in them. And if you look at your attendance card, you'll see another name on the back. So there's, there are active conversations, but we just have to see where they go, and unfortunately. The man who could tell you isn't here. On the other one, I think I'm very firmly in the camp of actually we should be pushing for more and more coming in at the planning stage. Uh, the minister mentioned, I think it was Bovis Homes or, or someone like that, you know, said if you buy volume, prices come down. Well, duh, to an extent, of course they do. We have a housing shortage. We have homes in fuel poverty. Let's bring the two together and actually see what we can do to get a real supply chain going and bring these prices down and make people's lives easier. That's what we should be doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, I'm already two minutes over and I'm sure I'll be berated for that. So I just want to say <laughs> a big thank you to all our uh, panel and a big thank you to Energy UK for supporting today. Thank you.